This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Heretics by G. K. Chesterton. Chapter 6 Christmas and the Esthetes. The world is round, so round that the schools of optimism and pessimism have been arguing from the beginning whether it is the right way up. The difficulty does not arise so much from the mere fact that good and evil are mingled in roughly equal proportions. It arises chiefly from the fact that men always differ about what parts are good and what evil. Hence the difficulty which besets undenominational religions. They profess to include what is beautiful in all creeds, but they appear to many to have collected all that is dull in them. All the colors mixed together in purity ought to make a perfect white. Mixed together on any human paint box, they make a thing like mud and a thing like very many new religions. Such a blend is often something much worse than any one creed taken separately, even the creed of the thugs. The error arises from the difficulty of detecting what is really the good part and what is really the bad part of any given religion. And this pathos falls rather heavily on those persons who have the misfortune to think of some religion or other that the parts commonly counted good are bad, and the parts commonly counted bad are good. It is tragic to admire, and honestly admire, a human group, but to admire it in a photographic negative. It is difficult to congratulate all their whites on being black, and all their blacks on their whiteness. This will often happen to us in connection with human religions. Take two institutions which bear witness to the religious energy of the 19th century. Take the Salvation Army and the philosophy of August Comte. The usual verdict of educated people on the Salvation Army is expressed in some such words as these. I have no doubt they do a great deal of good, but they do it in a vulgar and profane style. Their aims are excellent, but their methods are wrong. To me, unfortunately, the precise reverse of this appears to be the truth. I do not know whether the aims of the Salvation Army are excellent, but I am quite sure their methods are admirable. Their methods are the methods of all intense and hearty religions. They are popular, like all religion, military, like all religion, public and sensational, like all religion. They are not reverent any more than Roman Catholics are reverent, for reverence, in the sad and delicate meaning of the term reverence, is a thing only possible to infidels. That beautiful twilight you will find in Euripides, in Renan, in Matthew Arnold, but in men who believe you will not find it. You will find only laughter and war. A man cannot pay that kind of reverence to truth solid as marble. They can only be reverent towards a beautiful lie. And the Salvation Army though their voice has broken out in a mean environment and an ugly shape, are really the old voice of glad and angry faith, hot as the riots of Dionysius, wild as the gargoyles of Catholicism, not to be mistaken for philosophy. Professor Huxley, in one of his clever phrases, called the Salvation Army Corybantic Christianity. Huxley was the last and noblest of those Stoics, who have never understood the cross. If he had understood Christianity, he would have known that there never has been and never can be any Christianity that is not Corybantic. And there is this difference between the matter of aims and the matter of methods, that to judge of the aims of a thing like the Salvation Army is very difficult. To judge of their ritual and atmosphere is very easy. No one, perhaps, but a sociologist can see whether General Booth's housing scheme is right. But any healthy person can see that banging brass symbols together must be right. A page of statistics, a plan of model dwellings, anything which is rational is always difficult for the lay mind. But the thing which is irrational, anyone can understand. 
That is why religion came so early into the world and spread so far, while science came so late into the world and has not spread at all. History unanimously attests the fact that it is only mysticism which stands the smallest chance of being understood by the people. Common sense has to be kept as an esoteric secret in the dark temple of culture. And so, while the philanthropy of the Salvationists and its genuineness may be a reasonable matter for the discussion of the doctors, there can be no doubt about the genuineness of their brass bands, for a brass band is purely spiritual and seeks only to quicken the internal life. The object of philanthropy is to do good. The object of religion is to be good, if only for a moment, amid a crash of brass. And the same antithesis exists about another modern religion. I mean the religion of Comte, generally known as positivism, or the worship of humanity. Such men as Mr. Frederick Harrison, that brilliant and chivalrous philosopher, who still by his mere personality speaks for the creed, would tell us that he offers us the philosophy of Comte, but not all Comte's fantastic proposals for pontiffs and ceremonies, the new calendar, the new holidays, the saints' days. He does not mean that we should dress ourselves up as priests of humanity, or let off fireworks because it is Milton's birthday. To the solid English Comtist, all this appears, he confesses, to be a little absurd. To me it appears the only sensible part of Comptonism. As a philosophy it is unsatisfactory. It is evidently impossible to worship humanity, just as it is impossible to worship the Seville Club. Both are excellent institutions, to which we may happen to belong. But we perceive clearly that the Seville Club did not make the stars, and does not fill the universe. And it is surely unreasonable to attack the doctrine of the Trinity as a piece of bewildering mysticism, and then to ask men to worship a being who is nineteen million persons in one God, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. But if the wisdom of Comte was insufficient, the folly of Comte was wisdom. In an age of dusty modernity, when beauty was thought of as something barbaric and ugliness as something sensible, he alone saw that men must always have the sacredness of mummery. He saw that while the brutes have all the useful things, the things that are truly human are the useless ones. He saw the falsehood of that almost universal notion of today, the notion that rites and forms are something artificial, additional, and corrupt. Ritual is really much older than thought. It is much simpler and much wilder than thought. A feeling touching the nature of things does not only make men feel that there are certain proper things to say, it makes them feel that there are certain proper things to do. The more agreeable of these consists of dancing, building temples, and shouting very loud. The less agreeable of wearing green carnations and burning other philosophers alive. But everywhere the religious dance came before the religious hymn. A man was a ritualist before he could speak. If Comtism had spread, the world would have been converted, not by the Comtist philosophy, but by the Comtist calendar. By discouraging what they conceive to be weakness of their master, the English positivists have broken the strength of their religion. A man who has faith must be prepared not only to be a martyr, but to be a fool. It is absurd to say that a man is ready to toil and die for his convictions, when he is not even ready to wear a wreath around his head for them. I myself, to take a corpus vile, am very certain that I would not read the works of Comte through for any consideration whatever. But I can easily imagine myself with the greatest enthusiasm, lighting a bonfire on Darwin Day. That splendid effort failed, and nothing in the style of it has succeeded. There has been no rationalist festival, no rationalist ecstasy. Men are still in black for the death of God. When Christianity was heavily bombarded in the last century, upon no point was it more persistently and brilliantly attacked than upon that of alleged enmity to human joy. Shelley and Swinburne and all their armies have passed again and again over the ground, but they have not altered it. They have not set up a single new trophy or ensign for the world's merriment to rally to. They have not given a name to a new occasion of gaiety. 
Mr. Swinburne does not hang up his stocking on the eve of the birthday of Victor Hugo. Mr. William Archer does not sing carols descriptive of the infancy of Ibsen outside people's doors in the snow. In the round of our national and mournful year, one festival remains out of all those ancient gaieties that once covered the whole earth. Christmas remains to remind us of those ages, whether pagan or Christian, when the many acted poetry instead of the few writing it. In all the winter in our woods there is no tree in glow but the holly. The strange truth about the matter is told in the very word holiday. A bank holiday means presumably a day which bankers regard as holy. A half holiday means, I suppose, a day on which schoolboy is only partially holy. It is hard to see at first sight why so human a thing as leisure and larkiness should always have a religious origin. Rationally, there appears no reason why we should not sing and give each other presents in honor of anything, the birth of Michelangelo or the opening of Euston Station. But it does not work. As a fact, men only become greedily and gloriously material about something spiritualistic. Take away the Nicene Creed and similar things, and you do some strange wrong to the sellers of sausages. Take away the strange beauty of the saints, and what has remained to us is the far stranger ugliness of Wandsworth. Take away the supernatural, and what remains is the unnatural. And now I have to touch upon a very sad matter. There are in the modern world an admirable class of persons who really make protest on behalf of that antiqua pulchritudo of which Augustine spoke, who do long for the old feast and formalities of the childhood of the world. William Morris and his followers showed how much brighter were the Dark Ages than the ages of Manchester. Mr. W. B. Yeats frames his steps in prehistoric dances, but no man knows and joins his voice to forgotten choruses that no one but he can hear. Mr. George Moore collects every fragment of Irish paganism that the forgetfulness of the Catholic Church has left, or possibly her wisdom preserved. There are innumerable persons with eyeglasses and green garments who pray for the return of the Maypole or the Olympian Games. But there is about these people a haunting and alarming something which suggests that it is just possible that they do not keep Christmas. It is painful to regard human nature in such a light, but it seems somehow possible that Mr. George Moore does not wave his spoon and shout when the pudding is set alight. It is even possible that Mr. W. B. Yeats never pulls crackers. If so, where is the sense of all their dreams of festive traditions? Here is a solid and ancient festival tradition still plying a roaring trade in the streets, and they think it vulgar. If this is so, let them be very certain of this, that they are the kind of people who, in the time of the Maypole, would have thought the Maypole vulgar, who in the time of Canterbury pilgrimage would have thought the Canterbury pilgrimage vulgar, who in the time of the Olympian Games would have thought the Olympian Games vulgar. Nor can there be any reasonable doubt that they were vulgar. Let no man deceive himself, if by vulgarity we mean coarseness of speech, rowdiness of behavior, gossip, horseplay, and some heavy drinking. Vulgarity there always was whenever there was joy, wherever there was faith in the God. Wherever you have belief, you will have hilarity. Wherever you have hilarity, you will have some dangers. And as creed and mythology produce this gross and vigorous life, so in its turn this gross and vigorous life will always produce creed and mythology. If we ever get the English back on to the English land, they will become again a religious people. If all goes well, a superstitious people. The absence from the modern life of both the higher and lower forms of faith is largely due to a divorce from nature and the trees and clouds. If we have no more turnip ghosts, it is chiefly from the lack of turnips. End of chapter 6